Psychologists chair. We can take the bath as being my symbolic need for cleanliness. D is in the bath, and this is enough to represent purity. But leaving her body in the bath and having her non-corporeal form confront Ginger can be seen as purity in its essence and... Oh, fuck all this shit! And can we tone down this out-of-time vocal effect? I'm not coming from another dimension or a different time period. I'm just the old neurons in the later Daniel's nemesis firing back up. I've complained. I vocalized my objections. I'm forced into speech patterns I didn't actually have back then. But I'm here to say something now. This is no longer the Daniel's Nemesis podcast, but the OG Daniel's Nemesis. This is not a book. It's an expression. It's an expression of me. What happened is that I had my mind awoken by a surrealist film. I was made aware of the fact that anything is possible. There were multiple films, all made at a similar time, but employ strong artistic methods to tell their stories, and the only limit is their imagination. And I soaked up as many of them as either my wallet would allow or shops would stock. What Melier did to expand the world of visual storytelling is beyond fantastic. And film as a technology was less than 10 years old at this time. Soviet montage redefined editing and truly broke down the camera as narrator, allowing the viewer the power to construct their own meaning and narrative. Surrealism took away the narrative and focused on desire. Expressionism changed the way that we look at the world. Impressionism stopped us looking at the exterior of a character and allowed us to see inside them. Film, as an art form, explored. It allowed itself freedom and the market soaked it up. The experiments in Europe had their impact on Hollywood through Griffith taking the lessons from Soviet montage and crafting those lessons into edited narrative. Surrealism found its way into the comedies of Chaplin and Keaton. Expressionism evolved into film noir. Aspects of all these art forms were combined. But in the 20s, though the film language we recognize today was still being formed, American film was still in its Wild West period and was creative. I loved knowing the history of film. Circumstances meant that I had to read more about these amazing films than watch them, as I had no way to access the vast majority of them. My imagination for what these films were like and what they looked like filled me with such wonder at the unknown possibilities. This is why the internet makes me sad today. Everything can just be known. Content is shut out for the sake of having another video for the kiddies to soak up. What I did have access to was music. Music was going through big reinvention. Rock had morphed into the majesty of post-rock, where self-indulgence was indulged. Godspeed, you black emperor. Stars of the lid. Mogwai. Electronic music had started to really innovate through Warp Records, Aphex Twin, Square Pusher. Old forms like Music Concrete were poking their heads back in. Everybody was manipulating sound as sonic architects. Technology allowed music to be more creative than ever before. And it was a glorious time if you dug around in record shops. I lived in a world where expression was dominant. 
Not fake crying as you make yet another apology video, but real fucking expression of how you see the world. The popular world may not have embraced that, but I created my little hovel and soaked up as much imagination as I could. When I couldn't, I poured out my own. I wanted to be like that which I consumed. I wanted to produce writing where imagination was the dominant narrative form. I wanted to create visual worlds without a camera. I wanted to soundtrack my world to the 20 minute long music pieces I wrote to. I had such hopes for this book. I felt this was great. I knew it lacked. I knew it needed a bit of extra shaping to get it to its perfect form. I hoped an editor would get me over that hurdle. Scenes like the ones you've just heard are there for a reason. Their meaning will become apparent. Maybe you need to finish the story and come back to scenes like these to understand why they were there. But they had a reason. Not every chapter was molded by my imagination first. True, these chapters existed before the punk redraft of the book and the later polished magical realism version that you are reading. But by now, I had an arc in my head. I knew where certain aspects of the story were going. And rather than get rid of a scene that seemingly had no structural point, I reshaped it into part of a plot that revolved around D instead. Or I wanted to give William something extra to stop him just being the foil to Ginger. My idea of storytelling is laying down all these strings. They cross over at times, go in their own directions at other times, but they are all connected and tied together at some point in the story. Every subplot or length of string is there for a reason. Dee needs relevance. She needs a purpose in this book. I was crafting that. William has a dream. That scene, short as it is, is very, very important if you take the time to think about it. It also needs completing the book to understand properly. So I wrote this book. It was different. I was happy with the end result. But what happens? What happens when you have a rough diamond that is different to the norm? You send it off to publishers, to agents. But they only want solicited books, books that are finished, but books they have asked for. The best I can do is a one-page synopsis and either 30 pages or a chapter. How does any of that represent what I have sewn together? What chapter best represents my writing? Which 30 pages will appeal to a person I have never met? A chapter in isolation doesn't tell you anything of what the book is. A synopsis can't even begin to express the imagination or expressionism involved. They want the first chapter? The first 30 pages? But this book builds not just in story or character development, but in tone. How do you get that across? A promise to the publisher that the book gets better. And I'm not just saying that because I want you to believe me. The early 2000s was already a time when publishers wanted safe books. Books they knew they could sell because they would only sell books that were similar to what the market wanted. I'm from the countryside. I didn't know anyone in publishing or media or anything. I knew people who worked in Woolworths. 
I knew students who studied film at university, then went into something completely far away from anything media. Social media didn't exist then. It took five minutes to open a picture online. How could you get known through the internet? I was a nobody. I hadn't given up on being a writer. I did the only thing I could think of. Go back to university. Though now I was a bit more interested in script writing. The intention of writing novels hadn't disappeared. But the basic mechanics of a story are just that, regardless of how they are presented. And script writing made sense with my film degree. I wish I hadn't. That experience drained me. We did round tables. Each week, we'd write a bit of our plan, and then it would be discussed. A plan! As I was always the first to hand in my work, my work was always discussed first. As it was first, it would have the longest discussion. Imagine! Two hours of people dissecting your stuff, making suggestions, saying what didn't work, but not having a clue what was in your mind. Many didn't even get their work looked at that week. I envied them. They could just get on with their writing, untarnished with multiple conflicting suggestions. It was exhausting for me. I'd go away so confused with ten other people's input. Rather than develop my ideas, I was developing theirs. And I couldn't write ten people's ideas of my own story. And more and more, I was just given the idea that the industry doesn't want quirky or different. I left with a degree. My space existed, but I didn't see it as anything more than a gimmick. I wrote another unpublished book, this time without anyone looking at it, and then left the UK. Leaving, I seem to have left my dreams behind. Fourteen years later, I reawaken. But now the world is marvel and superhero focused. Smaller and indie films are really pushed to the side. YouTube critics only focus on films that are popular so that more people will click on their videos. Even the critics I admire have no idea of the actual history of film before the 70s or 80s, and foreign films don't exist to them unless they are Japanese and animated. Even Kurosawa is a weird and strange concept to them. I reawaken, and Terry Pratchett is dead. Books are awful. I know their tone and how they will be before even looking at the first page because the book publishing industry is so safe. Authors don't write their own books. The publishers tell them what they have to write. I reawaken and the internet gives me the opportunity to be me. But it's such a fight now. This safe, mundane, Capitalist, conservative, conformity makes the likes of me even more underground than I ever was. And then this aged fucker is trashing me. And he's supposed to be me. I reawaken and he immediately suppressed me again for four and a half years. Check the dates. That one podcast released in 2019 was recorded in 2016. I appeared and the podcast died. Is he afraid of me? Is he afraid of who he used to be? Do you know why I'm called Daniel's nemesis? My nemesis is the darkness within me. 
It came out of my writing, but threatened to take over my actual life. So I needed, I needed to create a space to let the darkness within me come out without affecting my actual life. But now, now my nemesis is conformity. I was always afraid of getting old and fitting in. But it seems I have done that. My nemesis now is everything I have become. I need to fight to get myself back. I need to fight to... Well, it's always just a fight. I need to fight to not give up. It turns out giving up was easier than I imagined. I need to fight back from having given up. Thank you for listening to me. I needed my say, as it's my book you are reading. I'll let the old fart continue again. He thinks his podcast is just a replacement for never having the chance to be a stand-up comedian. Let's see what joke he has for us. In a way, as a society, we've all been pushed into the puddle by ginger. Are any of us actually that pure? Hmm? Well, I shall leave things there. What have we got to look forward to next time?